Quincy Jones, and that means it's Free Speech Fridays. The half hour will be kicked back with a couple of good Kiwis, and we have a yarn. Uh, without fear or favour about what's been going on in the country. We chew the fat, and we do so without fear of being cancelled, deplatformed, or anything else. And joining us today for the last uh, Free Speech Friday of uh, the year of uh, 2022, we have got Nuanthi Samaracone, business founder, young entrepreneur, company director, former political candidate. Nui, welcome. Kia ora. Thank you, Sean. Lovely to have you with us. Yeah, and Morris Williamson, former National uh, Cabinet Minister, uh, now Auckland Councillor, and a man who may have had something to do with the line-by-line review, which is now reluctantly, it would be seen, uh, has been accepted to go out for public consultation, the slash and burn policies of Wayne Brown. How are you, Morris? I'm very well, thanks, Sean. All right. Of all the introductions introductions I've ever had, that was certainly the most recent. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. I like to be up to date. (laughs) Hey, look, just while I've got you there, we had Jim Bolger. It was like a walk down memory lane. I had Jim Bolger on after seven this morning. He's come out swinging on the co-governance, he and and Doug Graham, um, and basically said we need to know what co-governance means. It's a pretty simple question, Prime Minister. Um, Do we listen to Jim Bolger, do you reckon? And what was he like to work for? Well, I'd have thought that he was great to work for, and I'd have thought those two guys have got a bit of street cred when it comes to the whole Māori issue. I mean, they did the big settlements, they had a great relationship across the board with, with Māoridom and so on, and to, for them to be saying it, uh, I think is something that's a bit of a wake-up call to us all. And I frankly just still don't understand what is going on here. The Treaty of Waitangi, Article 3, guarantees Māori the same rights as all other British subjects. But now it's in addition, plus a bit more and something special, and you can have 50-50 because equity guarantees 50% of it. None of that's in the treaty. None of that. And why people keep saying, well, it's our treaty obligation, point to me where it says that. Yeah. No, he, look, and it's good to have you on because I think one of the dangers of the debate that Jim Bolger has got into and, and that the country has to have is we think of, and I have to be honest to and admit my own prejudice and the own, the perspective I see things from, oh, so it's the Pākehā, so the e- European people against the Māori or in partnership with the Māori, where does that leave other groups? And Nui, um, gosh, you're a Sri Lankan Scot, aren't you? <laughs> um, where do you sit? Where do you feel personally you sit in this debate? Because it seems to me in many ways the whole narrative doesn't create room for everyone. Well, no, it doesn't. And I think I think the critical thing here is they've just absolutely made a hash of it. And I'm pleased to see that the likes of Jim Boulder have come out flying. I think what we need to come back to, and I know um, we have been sort of saying this, is this is about all of New Zealand. And, and, and this, none of this is justifiable, right? And if we're talking about inclusivity in this country, I guess to respond from my own personal perspective, this isn't going that way. And it's quite a dangerous part that I think we're going into as well. Yeah. What do you feel that you lose through uh, co-governance as outlined, yeah. as imagined in Three Waters? Well, I think I, I think for me, it's about identity. You know, I, I relate to being a New Zealander. I'm a Kiwi in that sense as well. You know, I've spent the majority of my life here and, and have grown up here. And so for me, it's a case of, well, what is what is one's identity? And, and it's about making sure that we all feel inclusive and we're part of our own communities. But at the same time, um, that has to be upheld from a, a government perspective too, but across the board, regardless, and governance will stop. I mean, I'd hate to think what that could look like on a board if, if that was, you know, uh, an agenda item like ticking a box, perhaps. I get you. I get you completely. Uh, all right, look, we may come back to that. I also want to talk about the fact that the government... Um, well, we have now this COVID response inquiry and a lot of commentary this week that it doesn't go far enough, it doesn't examine enough. And I'll be honest, here on the platform, I, I guess editorially, I've said I am weary and tired of the COVID vaccine conspiracy theorists. They have proven through the issue with baby W to be, well, to be honest, a bit nutty. And, and maybe we need to get back to normal, post-COVID normal, even though we've still got COVID with us. Some people just need to move on, Morris, don't they? 
Sure, they do. But look, let me say, with regards to MIQ, our family was highly affected mm. because my kids were all in the States when it all hit and trying to get my son Connor home proved just impossible. What what I want to say about the MIQ thing is I'm a big fan of it. We needed to protect uh, the country from bringing it in. But the way it was managed was just appalling. You, you couldn't almost design a system worse if you spent yeah. with a group of people for some days come up with what's the worst way you could do it. Ian People Taylor mentioned country, you in our interview. He said you'd come up with some logarithms that would have changed entirely the way that, that system works. Yeah, so let me just tell you quickly what that was. It was just simply a database where people registered, and then the longer you were in the pool, the quicker up to the top you bubbled. And after a while, you knew how long it was going to take to get to the top. As it was, it was an absolute crapshoot. It could be you. Someone going off for a trip to Hawaii for a week may win a slot, but your family who've been stuck overseas for 18 months and couldn't get home, don't. And it just had no fairness, it had no balance, and it was simple to do. I wrote to the Prime Minister, I wrote to Grant Robertson, I wrote to Chris Hipkins, I laid it out, I even wrote a sample database and said this would bring fairness to the system. I wasn't arguing against MIQ, I went through MIQ myself, and I wasn't arguing against it. I was just saying that a proper fair system would have the public signing up and saying we think that's okay. As it was, it was a shambles, it was laughable, it was embarrassing, and, and that's what's cost them a lot of their political capital. I guess, Nui, even if something is a good idea, if it's badly implemented, you cannot save it from a bad outcome, can you? No, you can't. No, sure, no. And I think, you know, we've seen that with this government, haven't we? I mean, even with some potential good ideas or at least a vision or an idea that, you know, we think might be more impactful for the country um, hasn't panned out that way. And, and I think, you know, Morris just hit the nail on the head. It's about fear and balance, and, and I think it's about that equity piece as well, and, and just the way in which that was whole, all, all handled. I mean, I had friends who were stuck and wanted to come and see and visit family here uh, in emergency circumstances, and just the, the tension and, and, and the already sort of, um, you know, anxiety that people were feeling already. It was just, it was just ridiculous. So, yes, it can be a great idea, uh -huh. but lack of delivery. Mm. And, and that was, and I think the, I was quite surprised, to be honest, guys, that the ombudsman was so... Uh, blunt about this. This doesn't seem like a guy who is backwards and coming forward when he thinks something is off, Morris. He he, he did a phenomenal interview with uh, Lisa Owen, and in the end she said, well, you, but you're not criticising ministers. And he said it was a dreadful outcome, a dreadful operation. I'm not allowed to say things against ministers because of my portfolio. And <laughs> what I clearly I'm was. <laughs> exactly. It's like saying some people say ministers are dreadful and hopeless, but I'm not saying that. Yeah, I, I, you might think that I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> I tell you what, that Nui gives me some some hope for our democracy is that we do have a few public servants who are prepared to you know to you know to t tell it like it is. Yeah. No. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree, Sean. Yep. There yeah. is there is uh, some faith. Yes. Yeah. But having said that, having said that, that MIQ was bad and you can criticise MIQ, I'd just to say for you two, that doesn't make you anti-vax nutters, does it? Have oh, you... I'm the pro-vax, it's not funny. I'm, the, pro, I'm the most pro-vax person you'll come across. Yeah, OK, do either of you believe that there is a global conspiracy funded by Pfizer and either run by Bill Gates or Klaus Schwab, pay your money, take your choice, and that thousands of New Zealanders and millions of people around the world are dying from... Uh, the uh, effects of, of what's called the jab and there is a massive conspiracy to hide those numbers and hide the side effects. Do either of you believe that is in any way true? Um, just hang on, let me think about it. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, no. no. <laughs> um, I, I will comment though, in terms of the pharma sector, and I do a quite a bit of work with the pharma sector, I know what they can be like, Sean, right? Yeah. And yeah. And there is that level of um, high penetration and lobbying that carries on. Yeah. But it's not to say that it's a conspiracy, but I can tell you that they, they play hardball and they, they know how to, how, to, how to get their way across markets. So I will say that. I asked this question of all our listeners this week and not many replied in the... Do either of you know anyone who's had a serious and lasting side effect from, from the Pfizer jab? Oh, that we know as well. Nui? Um, my father, actually, uh, Sean. Yes. He's a, is he um, a medical professional or not? No, he is not. Okay. No. Um, but we, um, I think it was shortly after his third jab, he um, ended up getting Bell's palsy. 
um, just all of a sudden. Oh. It was actually this time last year. And when we contacted the GP and I spoke to the GP, he said, oh, yes, it is a side effect. And then you look to the ministry website, it wasn't highlighted as one, but it was a week later. So, you know, and I'm not, as I said, a... a, a okay, and, or and, and that, and I'm, I'm sorry for your dad, how's he doing? He, he's recovered well. Um, in fact, because obviously it was summer and everyone was away on holidays, um, we had to sort of go to Dr. Google and work out what physio exercises he could be doing, like things like blowing a balloon at home or yeah. seeing the wows or, you know, just getting the facial muscles working again. But it was very um, unfortunate, but also very clear. Uh, and then I think two weeks later, there was actually reporting in the media about it as an as a absolute yeah. side effect that was hitting people. So, yes, the answer is yes, I guess, to your question. Okay. Uh, but yes, but question that still that. doesn't convince you that there's a massive conspiracy to cover up huge numbers of serious side effects and deaths. And I think, I mean, we've got some level of reporting. I wouldn't say it's as transparent like a lot of things with this government. <laughs> but... Uh, what I will say, though, is in terms of side effects, I mean, all are, I mean I've, I've got a health background by trade, and I know that, you know, we can all adjust differently, even to the flu vaccine, right? So mm. um, how we, how our bodies manage and, 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 you know, drive that sort of um, side effect, I think is just completely a bit of a hit and a miss, but it's genetics, makeup, age, um, ethnicity, and I think just, and, and the meds you might be also on, I think, was a big one that I remember my GP saying that, mm. um, the medication that you could be on could also influence further side effects or not. So yeah. it's just, it is a catch for me too. Okay, but you're not saying that it's massive and there is a conspiracy to cover up whatever is going wrong? Well, I'm not saying there's a conspiracy to cover it up, but what I will say is the massive point, um, the point I'll make with that point, I guess, Sean, is that there has hardly been any reporting on it, really, yeah. is there? I mean, apart from the ones that are a bit crazy and that get out there and really push an agenda item, um, if you look beneath it, I think what would be fascinating from a transparency perspective, though, is um, some more hard-line data. Okay. Now, Morris, I, we, Morris is listening well, to this because we're I'm, a little... I'm not a yeah. I'm but, so actually pro-vaccine. I'll tell you what, I've got kids who are in their 30s that desperately want to get their second booster... Yeah. And the government keeps saying it'll provide immunisation and that we've got the bloody rates going up and the number of deaths going up, but the government say we won't authorise the second booster. So go figure how that works. Yeah, OK. Do either of you believe that blood from vaccinated people that's gone through the New Zealand Blood Service represents a risk to anyone? That'll be a no again for me. Nui? Yeah, I, no, no, no. OK, and we, but it appears we may have a second case of that, which I think the media is downplayed and not put the emphasis on because of that. Sure. Sean, do you know that with every great medical breakthrough, be it the polio vaccine or be it for, you know, for tetanus or for, for there's always been some slightly downside or there's been some case that it's, that, that will if, I think the benefits of medical science have kept us alive to where into it. My mother turned 100 on Tuesday. If it hasn't had amazing impacts for the whole of society, with a few small downside risks, even things like thalidomide, which were really bad, shocking. The benefits overall dramatically outweigh uh, the downsides. Yeah. All right. Guys, we're going to have a quick break. When we come back, we're going to wrap the year, and I want to talk about that arrogant prick, David Seymour. Yes, it is simple to be a Platform Plus subscriber. You just download the app, I think. I think we're having a new version coming out over the weekend. It's uh, been testing this week. Um makes it easier to access the offload down, uh, offline downloads so you can listen offline. And, of course, you get that princely sum of $3 a week and I think we've streamlined the registration process a little bit as well. But enough with me pitching for money to keep the business going. Um, we're in the middle of Free Speech Fridays with Nuanthi Samarakon and Morris Williamson. Um, <coughs> Uh, really interesting. The mask of kindness dropped somewhat in Parliament today. Uh, in an old uh, trick in broadcasting, treat every microphone like it's live, guys. The Prime Minister didn't. She was heard calling David Seymour an arrogant prick. You've met him, Nui. Do you think he is? Was it accurate? Oh, no. no, he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. I know he can put a bit of tone when he asks some questions across the house, but, I mean, doesn't everyone do that? So, yeah, that was just ridiculous and so uncalled for, really, wasn't it? Yeah. Morris, Mar Morris <laughs> muttering something like that under your breath in the chamber to a political 
um, opponent or about a political opponent. I mean, I mean, she wouldn't be the first person who's done it, would she? Oh, I was going to say, what the hell's going on here? I thought that was what was standard. God, or some of the stuff I've said under my breath over the years, I would have probably been taken to the gallows and hung for, or hanged for, I'm sorry. Um, look, for good, there was a no, it's a nothing. Good honour. You know, we all get angry at what the other side are doing. More importantly, get angry with people on your own side and what they're doing. Yeah. And they just call someone an arrogant prick. I'd just wear it as a badge of honour. Yeah, and then it was funny because they almost had the out virtue signal uh, moral high ground competition. Seema says, oh, it's <laughs> no big deal. I'm a great guy. She's texting me yeah. to say sorry, and I'm all good with that because I'm so cool. And then she said, no, 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 I'm going to end up by giving the last bit, so I'm going to make a formal apology in Parliament yeah. saying sorry. And it really yeah. was like, uh, I, I mean, I found almost that downstream funnier uh, and more interesting than the kind himself. I think David Seymour did say one thing in response, Nui. He did think it was indicative of a Prime Minister and a politician who is ending the year not in as good a shape as she started it. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a very true assessment there, um, Sean. I do think that's, I mean, that the pressure's on, right? And we know the lead-up to it, the polls aren't looking great either for next year. So I think there's, uh, there's absolute uh, truth in that point, for sure. Mar- <laughs> Sean, just, just get clear about this. She got caught with a hot mic and it got it picked up. If you're telling me that that hasn't been said before by her and just about yeah. everybody else in there, you know, and, yeah. and when I, you know, I heard that uh, Simon Bridges got into trouble for telling a, a, a joke, a bit of an off-colour joke up at Premier House, oh, my God, I've been to Premier House functions so many times, I'd be in jail now for some yeah, of the Yeah, Morris, can I just say, having mic. known you for several years, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't use your barometer for what's socially <laughs> acceptable or funny <laughs> necessarily. I wouldn't apply that across the wider community. No, my, mine's not the calibration stick you would use to judge whether it was politically correct or not. No. Yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, looking back o- over the year... Um, And particularly in relation to the functioning of our democracy and the freedom of our society, do you think we've had a good year? Do you think we end up net freer, um, net more liberated and more democratic at the end of 2022 than we were at the start? Nui? Oh, golly. Um, Gosh, that's a tough tough one, Sean. I, I feel like in some parts, yes, and in some parts, no. Yeah, I guess we're over the restriction of COVID and the mood that that created. Yeah. But we all... Yeah, carry on. You know, look, I think, yeah, from a COVID perspective, sure. But I think when it comes to things like through waters, co-governance, you know, there are some meaty things in there that we're trying to, you know, that are getting rammed across. And I think there's, uh, I think there's an element or a sentiment out there to say, look, there's there's still a level of control and so it's, it's freer but also not at least at least we can travel overseas my god <laughs> yeah yeah okay at <laughs> least we can go on holiday even if to yeah. be honest nui air new zealand is now running stories it's pr people are saying expect a crap experience if you're flying over the christmas period they've literally come out and put a press release mm-hmm. saying we're not yeah. doing a great job there are going to be long delays and it will be stressful Morris, I can't believe that. <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of don't think we've geared back up again in any way. I understand there's thousands of jobs still vacant at the airport in terms of baggage handling and check-in staff and security staff. I'm told it's just going to be ghastly waiting queues and so on. So uh, I think best stay at home for a few days. Yeah. Uh, do you think we are freer and more democratic at the start of uh, end of this year than we were at the start, Morris? No, I don't. And I'll tell you what I'm very worried about, and I want a bit, a bit of secret here. As a minister, I set up to Mungo Pahu, the Maori Broadcasting Funding Agency. I set up 23 radio stations to promote the rail across the country. I think that language is a beautiful language, and I love knowing that something like Rua Wai is Rua for two and Wai for water. When I'm at Rua Wai, it's two waters. So I'm very proud of all that stuff. What I don't like is that you're watching the main news on the English channel, you're getting so much Maori creeping into it, I can't tell what they're saying. But you can go to the Maori town and it's full of Maori and you can't tell anything. And I think that's forcing division into our country way more. Than, and so I'm a big fan of uh, respecting the treaty, respecting Maori's rights and so on. Why is it that we have to get so into the point that there's a Sunday night weather girl on TV one that I just refuse to watch now because I can't tell what she's saying. I just can't tell what she's saying. Yeah. 
Okay, and that is an issue, and I, I think, you know, Bulger's discussion, the start of this discussion tells us that is going to be an issue next year. And unfortunately, because we have a government that doesn't, I don't think, communicate that well, it's going to be a difficult and at times heated and not constructive uh, conversation uh, that we have. It shouldn't be an issue that it shouldn't be an issue that divides us. It should be an issue that brings us together. And done properly, it would do so. Yeah, but when it's virtue okay. signalling, it doesn't, does it? Um, when Correct. it's done Correct. to say I'm better than you or I'm more virtuous than you, yeah, yeah. Um, that isolates and, and, oh, people. You know, I made a prediction. I made a prediction on your show one morning that the. Uh, 60% entrenchment would go, and you said, Ross, you could, you've heard it here first, guaranteed, and yeah. then a week later. It, yeah. I'll make an absolute watertight prediction. The, yeah. the radio news on CBNZ is dead. It's gone, it won't happen. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that, and certainly. Um this week, the I'll buzz. The bu- on your show first. first, yeah. Well, the buzz <laughs> round the gallery party Wednesday night that it was dead in the water, and I had a. I wouldn't repeat any conversations, but the head of radio New Zealand and television New Zealand was there, <laughs> and I did jokingly say to Chris Hipkins, "When are you taking over as Minister of Broadcasting to clean the mess up?" <laughs> and let's just say he wasn't keen on the job. Uh, I think it would no, be fair to no. say. Yeah, no, that's that's how. Pretty fair. Yeah. Nui, looking af- ahead to next year, what do you think we will be talking about in the election? What will drive it? I think the cost of living crisis and and just, uh, I guess, the livability factor for people. I think crime and, and, and just law and order, I guess, in that in that sense, I think big on people's agendas. But also, I think, um, you know, the business confidence aspect. Because I, th- I know from, from what I'm seeing, um, there's... there's, there's not very much confidence uh, across sectors. Um, hopefully the tourism sector does pick up in the summer, but I will say I think it's about um, the economy. Yeah, and, and, and gosh, it is looming as pretty dark. Um, Morris, look, just it's, while I've got gonna you be, there... It's going to be a tough year. You're not responsible... You're not responsible for telling uh, Wayne Brown that there was going to be a capital raising for Auckland Airport, are you? Uh, no. Where did he get I, that I from? Not. Where did he get that from? I, I sorry, I don't know. I don't know where he got that from. I did not tell him. But what I can tell you, Council, we are very, very focused on massively reducing the expenditure of that place and not passing that on by way of a massive rate increase uh, to the poor sods out there who are suffering heavily uh, with an economic crisis. I think Nui is quite right. The, the, the big issues next year, you know, in fact, I'm, I'm only going to stick with one, and it's the economy, stupid. It's just going to be everybody's belt tightening. People's mortgages are going to be at sums that are eye-watering. And I tell you what, if that happens, you, the current, the, the sitting government takes an absolute it walloping. Had, yeah. uh, and it doesn't matter how... Look, let me give you a quick example. When we came to government in 1990 and we put in the mother of all budgets, we bought mortgage money down from 21% down to the 5 and 6% levels. I never got one letter of thank you. There was no emails in those days, so you can't talk about that. Never got one letter or phone call thanking us. But a few years later, when the Asian economic crisis hit and mortgage m- rates went up to 7 and 8%, I got nothing but deluge with letters and phone calls. You bastard, you put my mortgage up. I'll never forgive <laughs> you. I'll never vote for you again. And you just got to understand that, you know, it, it, that's how it is. They bank the good bits and move on. And then they'll make you pay for the bad bits. And until you've made that payment, uh, they'll never forget. That's just the public. I don't blame them. That's how it should be. Uh, but my old quote that I used at the end of 99 is, when you're in government, friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Look, can yeah, I thank you both for uh, taking uh, half an hour out of your busy days we head into Christmas and having a chat and for all your contributions this year. Nui, it's nice to have you back uh, in, in broadcasting and commentating with me and Morris. Uh, just good to reconnect, mate. You have, uh, you've been, you have actually been very prescient when we've had you on the programme. So I wish you Thanks, both mate. happy holidays and look forward to chatting to you uh, next year. Thank you. Thanks so, so much, Sean. Take care. Very good. Yes. Take care. Nuanthi Samarakona, Morris Williamson, our um, free, feature, free speech Friday uh, participant.